Hi everyone, welcome to Adrian's Digital Basement. In my last video on this computer, I got this computer for 60 bucks locally here in Portland, and it didn't work initially because I didn't have a power supply, but I managed to get it booted up using an ATX to PC Junior power supply adapter, which I built, but then I found that I couldn't use the keyboard. So the computer was working, at least I was getting a boot screen, but we couldn't actually type anything and get the computer to boot at all. So in this video, I'm going to try to get this computer to the point where I can play some games on it, and we'll see what the PC Junior is all about. So in the last video, I was using this little power supply adapter I bought here to run the computer. So this adapter was designed to use a Pico ATX power supply, which should be low enough profile that the case top will go on properly while the power supply is installed. Now, I've ordered a Pico ATX power supply, and let's take a look at it. Here's the package. I picked this up from eBay. I will show the listing information in the description so you can check this out if it works. Take a look. This is the Pico ATX power supply. According to the description here, it shows that this takes a 12 volt input. So right off the bat, I see a little bit of an issue. I noticed that the ATX power supply connector has more pins than the socket does on the adapter. But I think the way this is gonna have to work is if I look closely at these, and this actually all fits perfectly, but there we go. And I think these extra pins over here are just 12 volts that are used on newer motherboards for extra power. And clearly the PC Junior is not gonna need this. The original power supply was just 45 watts. So before I plug it in the PC Junior, I wanted to test it on an actual computer. So here I have the Pico ATX running a Core i3. It's an older Core i3, it's a first generation. But yes, it's powered up this board. As you see, the fan is running and the computer's booted properly. Let's just quickly check the voltages on here. So five volts is looking nice and solid. 11.6. So I think this is an unregulated voltage and it's definitely a little bit of a dropout happening with this uh, four amp power supply. It probably needs a five amp power supply to be a little bit more solid. Why don't we measure how much current it's going through here, 3.81 amps. So we're definitely probably approaching the limit of this power supply here. All right, so the Pico A2X is connected and let's see what happens. All right, that's excellent, it's working. So I'm stoked that this works, uh, but there's an issue. So yeah, the issue is it sticks up too high. Now it's hard to see because I have to line it up, but you see how the edge of the board is higher than this RAM expansion? That means that the lid's not going to go on. So I think I'm going to have to order another adapter that this 24 pin one is just not going to work in here. I'm going to need to order a 20 pin because that means this whole part of the board will be missing. So that's a bummer. But luckily this was just $12, so it's not the end of the world. And uh, we can continue on with the other testing. So I spent a little time cleaning up the machine and I have to say it cleaned up really well. I used my usual technique of using Windex to get the grime off and then Magic Eraser to get the marks and the overall grime off. And that just returned this computer to almost new condition. The keyboard, on the other hand, it looks a little yellow, but I watched 8-Bit Guy's video on his PC Junior restoration and he retrobrighted his keyboard and he said it never really turned to the same color as the computer. So I'm probably just gonna leave this because it's not that bad anyways. And you might notice that I did attempt a little bit of a silver label here as a first try and yeah it looks absolutely horrible. I had some metallic tape and it's just really not smooth so I'm gonna need to order some new stuff along with some clear labels so I can try to make a reproduction label like the 8-bit guy did. I'm gonna leave this on here now though because I think I was just being really bothered by the ugly square here and at least if I don't look closely at this it's not so bad. The keyboard itself cleaned up pretty nicely. I just took it apart and I cleaned it up. And I used 303 on the keys, which is my normal plastic restaurant. And one thing about 303, it's a little bit oily. It's kind of like a lubricant. And people all commented that the keys on the PC Junior squeak. And I have to say, now that I've put 303 on here, there's absolutely no squeaking whatsoever. Everything is nice and smooth and the keys aren't binding up either. One thing that's interesting that may not come off too well on the camera is that the, the black lettering has some strange sort of red haloing around some of the symbols. It's really obvious here on the seven. See that red? 
It doesn't clean off though. I tried cleaning it and I didn't want to rub too hard in case it rubbed one of the letters off. But let me know in the comments if this is a typical problem on PC Junior keyboards. So speaking of the keyboard, one of the issues of course I had in the last video was I don't have an IR receiver for this computer and there was no way for me to use the computer because it won't boot without a keyboard connected. So lots of people had a suggestion on how to make a keyboard cable and I've gone ahead and done that. So to make a keyboard cable for the PC Junior, all you really need to do is consult the technical service manual from IBM. You need a six conductor phone cable, so one that has all six metal contacts in there. And then you can just use some typical DuPont style connectors and you just solder them together onto the cable. The technical manual clearly states the pinout, which is actually very helpful, and it makes it very easy to make this cable. I gotta thank IBM for being so clear on this. So what I've done is I've taped the four connections here that go into the computer into the right square that goes into the keyboard connector, if that makes sense. All right, so the way you connect this is with the two ground pins, which are brown on my particular harness. They go towards the bottom. And it's a little precarious, I gotta say, with this cheap harness. So it's not a very good permanent solution, but it definitely is gonna work for testing. All right, so we're gonna plug the keyboard cable here into the back of the keyboard. And unfortunately, since I had such a short wire, I just used the one that was included with the computer. And I prepared a boot disk. It's interesting, who's ever seen a Fred Meyer floppy disk? Fred Meyer is a supermarket slash general goods store here in the Portland area. And they've obviously been around a long time because I ended up finding some floppy disks from them. So we'll put this in. We'll close the floppy drive. Oh yes, oh yes. So it's working. Oh, how amazing. Okay, so because I'm using an RGB monitor, what mode CO80 should change this into 80 columns mode. Yes, it did. Definitely seems a little bit slow, but hey, that's awesome. The keyboard is apparently working. Okay, I'm really excited. So the keyboard is working. The computer is working. Cool. So it goes into basic. Now, I was reading, and I think you do Control-Alt Insert, and it runs uh, built-in diagnostics. Yes, there we go. Eight. I'm not sure what the difference is here. Maybe if you have the expanded memory, like this has 128K, I think that enables the additional graphics modes that aren't necessarily available. Ah, yes, 320 by 200 by 16 colors. So correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I think you need the 128K version of this computer to use this mode. All right, so let's try the sound diagnostics 9. Oh, interesting, pressing 9 didn't jump down there, just jump to the next one. All right. All right, let's hear how the sound works. Comes out of the speaker on the monitor here. I guess you have to wish enter. So these are the three regular channels of audio that this sound chip has. And there should be, I think, a percussion or a noise channel. I don't know if that's just the PC speaker probably, the built-in beeper. And maybe this is the noise channel? Uh, noise channel. Keyboard diagnostics. Oh, well how cute is this? What exactly is this? Okay, wow, this is very cutesy for a diagnostic program. So I, I guess the little guy goes, if I push Q, he'll jump down to Q. Wow, okay. Ah, oh, so silly. Okay, so I entered this disk diagnostics and it, whoa. I think it wants me to put a disk in the drive and <laughs> it shows a broken picture. I don't know if it's gonna erase my Fred Meyer disk if I stick this in. So I'm gonna stick a different disk in. Okay, I give up on this. I think the drive works. I mean, it's able to boot DOS and works pretty well. Speaking of the disk drive and I've gone freehand, so sorry for the shaky cam. I noticed something while cleaning this computer, which is quite interesting. There's a, there's actually a sticker on the disk drive, and there we go, you can get a good view right there. 
it's covering like a little indented area and I can't quite tell what's underneath there but I'm almost thinking that maybe it's the original logo for this drive I think it's made by Cume and it's so hard to see I didn't even notice it at first but of course now I do should I peel that off is this normal for PC juniors a friend of mine has a PC junior as well and he took a look at his and his doesn't have the sticker here so in the last video, I pointed out that the infrared receiver is missing from the computer, and I'd really like to make this computer whole and have the infrared receiver just so I can test this keyboard that way. I know the keyboard works, so it's a matter of just getting the IR receiver to see if I can do the wireless part. That's kind of one of the cool claim to fame of this machine. So a very nice viewer, John, sent me a package here, and I think this is going to help me out. Let's open this up and take a look at exactly what he sent me. Look at that. This is the infrared receiver for a PC Junior. John actually sent me two of them. He had these both kicking around from when he used to have PC Juniors, and he offered to send them to me, so of course I accepted. He had no idea if these work. He also sent me something that's kind of interesting. This is a PC Junior to CGA adapter. So this would allow me to use this PC Junior monitor as a CGA monitor. Now I labeled these John 1 and John 2 just so I can keep them apart in case one doesn't work and I don't get confused. But let's start with John 1 and we're going to install this and see if it works. Well it took a little bit of fiddling but I got this on and just had to tilt the computer like that to see. But this is on it was actually a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be. So let's plug it into the monitor and see if it works. So with the IR module installed in here and I have the keyboard cable removed because remember this looped back ground is, disables the IR receiver. So with this removed and that installed, if I turn the computer on now, even though I have no batteries in the keyboard, I should still at least boot the floppy disk without the error B, and then I can put batteries in here and we can see it type. Okay, so I have some IKEA batteries in here and look at that, it's working, <laughs> it's freaking working. Oh, well, that is a thumbs up. Thank you so much, John. Okay, module two is installed. Here's the original module that was working. Power this up. Is the second keyboard module. That calls for a double thumbs up. Both modules are working. Well, wouldn't you know it, just when I got the infrared keyboard working, we have a new problem. I'm getting error H. And looking online, error H has to do with the floppy controller. And sure enough, when I reboot the computer, there's no more seeking from the drive. May as well just reseat all of these cards here. So this is the RAM expansion card. Floppy car, floppy controller card goes into that socket there. This is the power supply board. Turn this back in. I do have the power connected to the floppy drive cable and I did measure with the multimeter the 5 and the 12 volts on the power. Okay, so <laughs> I guess that was a bad connection on the motherboard. All right, so now this is working. What I wanted to do is test out how good the range was on this keyboard with the wireless. Yeah, I get you're not gonna stand like across the room or sit on your living room couch and have a very good experience because you have to point the keyboard perfectly at the front of the, the machine, but Hey, you know what? It's not that bad. I mean, it's, it's better than having a bunch of wires. I don't know. I kind of like it. So I got to give IBM credit for doing something kind of interesting there with the infrared keyboard. Okay, so I got the Pico ATX power supply in, the one that will fit inside the lid. Now, I just had the lid resting on the top there, but it does close properly. So the Pico ATX I got was from Amazon, but it's really an eBay version that comes from China. It's a 20 pin, so instead of having the extra pins that hang off, it's smaller width-wise, which means now the lid is able to close over this. This is a 90 watt unit. So you'll notice the capacitors on here. I've added some bulk capacitance, and this was really because I was troubleshooting an issue, which I'm gonna talk about in one second. 
you get a nice braided cable and this is the connector for the DC input. So to install it, you see the little uh, side piece here? That goes into the little slot that is there on the motherboard, just like that. Clicks in, and when you put the case down, there's a bit of a lip here. It holds onto this and keeps this nice and steady. I'm using this power supply. It's just one I found in my box. It's a 12 volt, three amp power supply, which I found to be enough. So interesting thing about this particular power supply is when you connect the DC, there's a little blue LED on there that shines all the time, whether this is on or not. So that might be annoying because it does shine through the sides of the case here. So that brings me to the problem I mentioned. I'm not sure what's going on, but let me show you the issue. The computer's booted up, it's working fine. If I hit Control Alt Delete, it will reboot, boot back into DOS. But here's the issue. Remember earlier we saw that error H for the drive controller and I thought it was just an issue with the seating? It's not. That's actually a problem with this machine. And here is how you get it to do it. So I'll just turn the computer off, wait for a second, wait for five seconds, whatever, turn it back on. And now we're going to get the drive H error, or the error H. Error H. And rebooting the computer won't fix that problem. It will just keep happening. And it seems like the only way I can get this thing to work properly is to turn off the power and maybe wait five minutes. And then it's, sorry, there, it's loud. It, and then it seems to work. Uh, sometimes if I just turn it off briefly like this, back on, it might work. Nope. The strange thing is, is that when the computer is working, if I turn it on, it powers up, boots up, it will work. I can leave it running for 30 minutes. Control delete, put disks in, everything works as normal. Turn it off for five seconds, turn it back on, then it doesn't work. And no matter how many control deletes you do, when it's not working, it just will not work. I've tried different power supplies. I've run it off my bench power supply and cranked the amps up. I've lowered it down to 11.9 volts, 12.5 volts, sort of tried different voltages. Nothing seems to matter. There's no correlation whatsoever. The, but the error H is a pretty generic error. If you have the floppy drive disconnected from the controller, you'll get it. If you have the floppy drive unplugged from the power, you'll get it. If the floppy controller is removed from the computer, you don't get it because it does know that the controller has been removed. So just go straight to basic, like you have cassette basic only. But with the controller in and anything disconnected, it will error out. What I've done is I tried a different floppy cable and that didn't matter. I've checked the pins on the controller and that didn't matter. I've reseated the controller. I put deoxid. I tried a different floppy drive. I tried this floppy drive and it does work uh, with the computer. So if the floppy is working, I'm not getting error H. It boots off this no problem, but then turn it off and on error H even with this connected. So it's not the floppy. I found that the motherboard wasn't actually screwed down. So see, I have a screw there. So there are clips that hold the motherboard in, but there were no screws around the connector. So I've installed four screws. I also inst installed this green grounding cable onto the motherboard, onto one of the screws there. So just to check everything is totally grounded against the case. And I tried different power cables from the power supply into the floppy drive. Both of these Pico ATX power supplies have the same exact symptom. I took a very close look at this controller card inspecting for any broken traces or any cracked solder joints. I tried cooling down the primary uh, IC here, which is the floppy controller chip, with cooling spray just to see if that made a difference, but it didn't seem to make any difference whatsoever. There's a couple electrolytics on the board here, so I actually clipped on some additional electrolytic capacitance just to see if that might help. I've checked all the voltage rails over very carefully with the multimeter and the scope, checking for excessive ripple or anything weird. So yeah, the, that's the error H, and I'm kind of stumped as to what the problem is. We're going to get it right here. It was just working. You saw it. Turned it off and on, and it's going to be error H. There it is. All right, we'll turn it off. Not touching anything inside the computer. Now it's working, just like that. Booting normally. What What's changed? I mean, the thing is all pretty warm here. I've had it running for probably an hour and now it's working again. I mean, it works, doesn't work, works, doesn't work. So let's talk about speed. So PC Junior uses an Intel 8088 processor, just like the IBM 5150, which is the original PC, 
and the IBM 5160, the XT, and it runs at the same 4.77 megahertz as those two computers. But from what I understand on PC Juniors that only have the 64 or the 128K of memory, it has a shared architecture with the video hardware and that slows it down a lot. Taking a look at MIPS here, this column here, if it's the same speed as the original PC or the XT, it will all be around 1.0. And you can see the overall performance, at least with this particular benchmark, this computer scores 0.55 or 55% of the speed of the original PC. So if you're going to run any software that you can get to work on this that also runs on those computers, it's going to run a lot slower. And really that brings me to the next problem. In the form I have this computer right here, 128K, we don't have very much free memory to work with. Now, even though it's 128K, which should be 130 something thousand bytes, it's actually got less available to the OS. And then of that, only 89, 89,984 bytes is free to a program while you're running DOS. Now, again, when you have a memory expansion like the uh, Junior IDE expansion or any of the old ones that were out in the, when this computer was sold, they can bring the computer up to 768K of RAM. And what that allows you to do is map the video memory into that extra space so you have a full 640K available to DOS and available to programs to use. So what does that mean if you buy one of these and you want to play some games on it? Well, you're not going to have very much luck. I essentially couldn't find anything that could run on this. Well, correction, I found one thing that does work. So I have a copy of Sierra's Laser Shoot Larry version 1.0, and I thought that this game would probably work on this machine. I mean, it came out around the same time, and it definitely works on the Tandy, you know, so it supports the PC Junior graphics, but I just figured it would work. So let's, let's give this a try. And that's it. It kind of accesses for a little while, you hear a beep, and the computer's locked up. So what's weird is some of the early Sierra games, when I tried them, they do this, they load and then beep, and then that's it. I don't think I can even push control to leave. Ah, oh, you can, okay. But then other ones, what happens is it will say 256K required. And the weird thing is, is Black Cauldron is one of the discs. And that particular disc says on the box 128K required, yet when you try to run it on this PC Junior, 256K. Now before you say something in the comments, of course, I could probably find some really old games from like 1981 or 82 that will work on this, maybe with CGA graphics. But the thing is, I'm looking for games that take advantage of the 16 color graphics and the three channel sound. And that's what I want to see. But after a lot of searching, I found one game that does work on 128K and does take advantage of the extra colors and sound. And this is the disc right here. All right, so disc error. So it says disc error here after booting this disc, which I know this disc works. And this is one of the issues here. Now remember I said, Usually when the machine has the floppy controller error, if it's booting and working, it stays working. Occasionally it gets into this mode where it can't read anything properly. And I can do control delete and it will probably just have the same error again. Let's see. Yeah, disk error. All I can do is power cycle the computer and see if it fixes it. So let's just give this a try. Nope. Try again. Nope. Nope, not working. I guess I gotta just wait longer. Okay, it's been a couple of minutes. Is it gonna work? Let's see. It's working. Will it boot? Disc error. Not working. Look. It's working, it's amazing. All right, so this is the game that I'm talking about that does work on this computer. Insert disc two, okay. So it's, this is a double disc game, but you notice there's no DOS, it just goes straight into the game. So that's probably how this works. There it is. King's Quest 2. This is one of the rare booting versions of the game, which I guess allows this to work on the machine. Here's the little intro sequence that you may be familiar with. There is music, there is sound. Games are possible with 128K. You just need the booter versions of these games. 
and I have a good friend who's a huge collector of Sierra games, and he doesn't have a single copy of any games that... Okay, so the music's really loud as well. The speaker on this monitor might be small, but it pumps out the volume. So my friend has a huge collection and not one of his games are this booter type. So I had to obtain this online from someone who had a copy and he gave me a disc image. I don't know how many booter versions of Sierra games came out. I assume this disc would probably work fine on a PC uh, XT or any other PC that's as compatible with a Tandy probably even. But at least on the PC Junior, it works. So that really sums up my experience with the PC Junior. It's been frustrating to say the least. I've just not been able to find anything that works on this machine that takes advantage of the graphics and sound. I mean, this is the only game I could find. So, therefore, like, it hasn't been really fun. I, I was kind of excited to play some old games that, that were designed around the time for this machine. From what I read, all the old Sierra games that, like, run DOS require the 256K minimum RAM on this. So you need the 128K sidecar or better to do any of those games. And I know what people are going to say in the comments are going to tell me to get the expansion module for it, but I paid $60 for this entire computer, as you see it here, and I'm spending $100 on an expansion thing that will... I don't even know if it has a case. I think you can't find those, so it's like a circuit board that just sits on the side of the computer. I don't really see myself using this computer, if I even if I had that. I'm probably just better off using one of my Tandys because they're faster, they have faster CPUs, and they're fully maxed out in memory anyways, and some of them have ISA slots, so I can add a compact flash IDE, which I've already done, and a network card. So those are all things I'll probably never be able to do with this without buying a bunch of really expensive or rare items. So with the disc controller problem, that just adds to the frustration. If you happen to have any suggestions about what's the issue with the disc controller, I'd love to hear it in the comment section below, but I'm honestly at a loss at this point, especially without another controller to try to kind of rule out if it's the motherboard or the controller that's the problem. So once again, a huge thanks to John for sending me the infrared module. That works absolutely fantastic. So if you have childhood memories of this computer about how much you love it, I'd love to hear about it. It'd be good to hear some positive things about this machine. So that's it for my video. I hope you found it interesting in some way, and I'm sure people have lots of comments. And this video will be very controversial, but feel free to put them in the comment section below. You know, give me a thumbs up if you like this or a thumbs down if you didn't. And thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.